Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series and Podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We are pleased to have Tomas Sandel, the founding director of the European Coalition for Israel, join us to discuss Israel and Europe. Might relations improve? Mr. Sandel will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I'll turn the discussion over to Mr. Tomas Sandel. Thank you for that um, nice introduction and thank you for having me at this uh, distinguished forum, Middle East forum that I've been uh, or had the privilege to, to follow for many years. And uh, just um, last week, I think it was, I had the privilege of um, listening to Caroline Glick uh, speaking on what she called a special bond between the United States and um, Israel. And uh, perhaps um, this was the uh, inspiration for me to try to look, it from, uh, to look at it from my angle, Europe and Israel. Is there a special bond? And in which case, what does this bond look like? Uh, can it be strengthened? And what is the future for um, European-Israeli relations? Um, let me also say that European Coalition for Israel is um, a grassroots uh, movement. We are not a think tank. Uh, I'm not an, primarily an academic, but um, an activist, uh, diplomatic advisor for uh, some or 20 years, which gives me, I believe, uh, uh, a unique insight into uh, European Israeli relations and how this have uh, these relations have developed and changed uh, over the years. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to give some background and then look at uh, some issues which I consider worth um, elaborating on further. Um, I'm also going to speak about what I would call uh, three contradictions in uh, European-Israeli relations. But if we start by stating the obvious that <clears throat> the European Union, or if we call it Europe, uh, the European bloc has or is not considered to be the best of friend uh, for the Jewish state. Um, I don't think this is so much open for debate as a matter of fact. Uh, if we look at uh, voting patterns in the United Nations, if we look at uh, EU-Israel relations over the last uh, 50 years, it's fair to say that, um, that Europe has uh, at least historically had a, a clear uh, pro-Palestinian uh, stance. Uh, that doesn't mean that there is not sympathy or an understanding for, for Israel in, in Europe, but uh, by and large, uh, one can say that whereas the United States has been a, a solid partner, Europe has been less so. And um, therefore, it might be interesting to note that this was not always the case, and also to, to ask the question, when was a uh, European position on, on the Middle East conflict uh, first uh, formulated and how did this common position come about? And um, the answer is quite uh, simple and straightforward. Um, the European community, uh, which was the uh, name at that time, did not have a common position on the Israeli-Arab or Israeli-Palestinian conflict until 1973. So the obvious question is what happened in 1973, which suddenly made the Europeans uh, come to a conclusions as to who was right and who was wrong in the Middle East uh, conflict. 1973, of course, and, and the autumn of 1973 is when the Yom Kippur War took place, followed by the oil embargo which then shaped European policy. Um, so this is uh, important to know historically that um, EU, what would later become EU policy in the Middle East, came about uh, as a result of economic pressure from uh, oil, from OPEC, the oil producing Arab states at the time. 
only later, uh, later on uh, over the years would this uh, position be uh, uh, formalized uh, and also somehow legally motivated or legally explained. But it's, it's crystal clear that when um, it first was presented, there were no legal implications or there was not even any time of, of having an uh, in-depth um, analysis of um, international law in, into the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but the uh, deciding factor was something very different. Looking at today, of course, uh, decisions related to, to the conflict are made in what we call the European Council, consisting of foreign ministers of the 27 member states. And um, here also to generalize, you can say that Europe has its um, traditional friends um, in Europe. Uh, it also has traditional um, enemies. Uh, a simple way to, to define who is who, and, and maybe this will be more time in the Q&A session, is to say that those countries in the, in the Central and Eastern uh, Europe who have lived under a totalitarian regime uh, are more likely to be pro-Israel than the traditional uh, Western um, democracies. Uh, immigration, mass immigration is also a very important factor in this uh, case. Um, one can also say that when we look at the uh, political institutions, be it on a national level or, or a European level, that there is a clear political divide. Um, Center-right political parties, by and large, in the European Parliament, in national parliaments, tend to be more pro-Israel, whereas uh, progressive left, uh, the Green, with the exception of, of important exception of Germany, I should say, tend to be more favorable towards the Palestinian uh, case. I mentioned three contradictions just to give some uh, uh, context. Um, historically. There is a saying there would be no Europe without the Jews, but equally true is the fact that there would be no um, Israel without Europe. This is in many ways a contradiction that the Zionist idea was first presented in Europe in cities like uh, London, Basel and, and San Remo, Italy, in that order. Um, and and uh, this is where or, or Europe was the the center of Jewish life uh, until the uh, Second World War. Uh, but Europe, sadly, is equally um, known for being the what some call the largest graveyard, the largest Jewish, gravi uh, Jewish uh, graveyard in the world. And uh, we just have to, to mention words like uh, the Crusades, Inquisition, pogroms, and, and of course the Shoah, uh, places like Auschwitz and Theresienstadt and Dachau to, um, to get the full picture of the uh, uh, contradiction in, in Europe as it relates to Jewish life. Uh, second contradiction, uh, perhaps, is the fact that Europe and uh, Israel has never been closer in terms of trade and, and uh, cooperation in general terms. Um, at the same time, Europe continues to have a, a, a problem with Israel, a problem in particular with any right-leaning uh, governments. And, and this has been a, a, a constant factor over the last 20 years that I have followed uh, EU-Israeli um, policies. But uh, in general terms, uh, EU and Israel has perhaps never uh, during these 20 years being closer than what they are today. And that can be measured in, in uh, terms of um, uh, trade and, and uh, cooperation. The uh, EU-Israel uh, Council Agreement, Association Council Agreement was just renewed a few months ago. And this is perhaps the best uh, um, sign that uh, things are actually moving in the right direction. Um, 
The third contradiction that for me is still a contradiction is that um, and this is to, to uh, say something really in honor of the European Union and uh, more concretely so the European Commission is today the world leader in combating anti-Semitism. And, and it, it's thanks to the European Commission that the IRA working definition on anti-Semitism has been spread so uh, successfully throughout the world. It's been pioneered and championed by, by the European Commission. While at the same time, the European Union continues to support anti-Semitism outside of the borders of Europe. And I'm thinking in particular of um, um, EU funding of the Palestinian Authority. EU is today the largest um, um, institutional funder of the Palestinian Authority. And uh, as we know, um, this is where the real problem is with the uh, incitement to hatred with the uh, um, institutionalized anti-Semitism in Palestinian textbooks and uh, many other very problematic uh, policies of the Palestinian authorities, uh, pay for slay policy, just to mention one, that um, a convicted murder or a terrorist can make five time or, or can have five time as high of a salary as a Palestinian teacher. And um, given EU's role in, in funding and, and sustaining the Palestinian Authority, uh, which makes the PA more or less a protectorate, uh, this is um, inexcusable. Um, but looking at uh, if anything has changed, what, what is happening that could uh, change this course? Uh, am I optimistic myself or pessimistic? <clears throat> um, of course, I, I think that the general development in the world is on the side of, uh, of Israel, <clears throat> which makes um, Europe uh, almost equally dependent on Israel today, as Israel in the past has been very much dependent on Europe, Europe always being the largest trade partner. <clears throat> but with the startup um, uh, Israel with um, new technology, um, with everything we've seen in Israel over the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, Israel has leveled up, which makes its uh, role so much more important. Um, what I see as some problems, I'll take these last few minutes to say what Israel could do better to um, empower the friends in, in Europe. There are many political parties on the so-called center-right, more on the populist side, who are strong allies, friends of Israel. Uh, not all of them are being accepted by Israel, by the foreign ministry. Some of them are on what is called a blacklist, an official blacklist, <clears throat> meaning that Israeli diplomats can have no uh, uh, contact with them, no engagement, which makes it very problematic. Uh, so to be very concrete, I think there are certain things that Israel can do to um, solidify the situation in, in Europe and, and just um, not shoot itself in, in the foot. I know this is a complicated uh, discussion in the Jewish community. Where do you draw the line? What are the red lines as to a political party which is not acceptable as, um, as a friend of Israel. But I think that uh, there are reasons to reevaluate where those lines should be drawn. And I think there are good historical examples where many uh, respectable parties today are in the, uh, have a, a past of being very anti-Israel, very anti-Jewish. And I think there are almost few exceptions in Europe where this would not be the case. Um, so um, um, this is something that I hope the new government will look into because we cannot have a situation where those who want to be, be supportive of, of Israel but they do not necessarily tick all the boxes uh, on a scale of intersectionality uh, can somehow be uh, sidestepped or sidelined. Um, Israel has uh, many friends in Israel, um, but um, it's also important that we uh, don't isolate uh, some of 
closest allies. So to give you a very concrete example, there was one um, particular government in, in Western Europe who recently got a new government. They, um, as they were formulating their government policy, one particular party was very uh, fervent in, in its support to move its embassy to Jerusalem. This was supported by the other government um, uh, partners. But at the end, um, this particular uh, party was, was on the blacklist of, uh, of the Israeli foreign ministry, which made it very complicated and difficult for them to push this line. Um, in conclusion, if Israel would have been a little bit more um, um, attentive to these signs, we could have had a, um, perhaps the first uh, Western European government to go ahead with an embassy move. So um, uh, the friends are there. Uh, there's a good potential for even better relations. But uh, as the old saying goes, it takes uh, two to tango. I think I used my 15, 16 minutes. I better stop here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We have quite a few questions coming in. Larry Greenberg asks, can it be argued that Europe needs Israel more than the reverse? Technology, natural gas, confrontation with Islamists of all stripes. Is, uh, is the EU's anti-Semitism just lip service? Yeah, so um, it, it's true. And what I was trying to say is that um, traditionally it has been the reverse. Europe has been uh, very dependent on, uh, sorry, Israel has been very dependent on, on Israel. And, and again, having Europe as its largest trade partner, uh, the uh, relations have been asymmetrical. Uh, but today, and quickly so, this is what is happening. And, um, and of course, I, Israel, you know, for reasons that, that are well known, have never used this leverage because if, if uh, Israel would suddenly say that, well, um, you know, we want to, uh, you know, what if, if, if we would boycott Europe, if we would um, um, draw in on, on I, all, all the high tech uh, contributions in Europe, you know, Europe would stop just like that. Um, so, he, he, he is right. This is the direction where it's going to. What I could mention also is that it's a very well-known fact that um, intelligence uh, and security uh, cooperation has been very, very intense for, for a long period. But this is usually done um, undercover and, and something which is not spoken about publicly. Um, and I think if, if it was only known, which is sometimes... Um, more the exception than, than the rule that Israeli intelligence have prevented terrorist attacks in, uh, in, in Europe. This would also have a, a consequence for European attitudes uh, towards, uh, towards Israel. Wonderful, thank you. Carrie Hillebrand asks, why can't or won't Israel do a better job of exposing the true ugly face of the Palestinian Authority uh, incitement in Arabic media, corruption, pay for slay, et cetera? Yeah, that's, um, that's, that's an interesting question. I, um, I, I, I don't think that the, the problem is that the relevant uh, policymakers in Europe and, and the members of the European Parliament would not be aware of this. So here I would give all credit uh, to Israeli NGOs and to the government for for making this a constant uh, talking point. And uh, the problem is more on the European side. And I think if anyone is to take responsibility or take any blame or shame, it would be, <laughs> including myself, that how on earth have we not been able to convey this point that, that um, uh, what is happening in the Palestinian uh, territories is not compatible with, with European values, with uni universal values. So I would probably phrase the question differently to say, well, how on earth can it be that the Europeans, um, despite all the evidence, is still uh, reluctant to, to make any changes? Uh, just last point there to say that there has been clear changes in the European Parliament. But as you know, the EU then consists also of a European External Action Service, 
where they are very resilient to um, put any pressure on, on the Palestinians. Thank you. Judith Rosen asked, uh, what is ECI specifically doing to help Israel, especially at the EU? Yeah, so we, well, first of all, we, we are a small organization. As it said in the intro, uh, we are the only non-Israeli, non-Jewish, non-American, which, which gives us a, a particular angle and I think also uh, uh, a favor. So we are trying to raise the issues which have also been raised here, take uh, um, EU funding of, of uh, Palestinian education. And um, I, I wish I could say that it had been entirely successful, uh, but that's, that's one example. And I think at least, you know, we've been able to raise the debate. The European Parliament has all the, the hard facts and have based on this, they have been able to freeze uh, Palestinian funding. We, um, um, at the moment, we are putting a lot of emphasis on the Abraham Accords, something I didn't mention in this you know, brief statement, uh, which I think can be a real game changer. Uh, when we celebrate, will celebrate our 20th anniversary uh, in March, uh, this will be the theme. And I think, again, um, for, you, for anyone to, to have to pick sides and and say, are we in the camp of peace or a normalization and cooperation, or, or do we remain in the camp of antagonism and conflict and war? Um, Israel has, a, has its best, perhaps best ever uh, card of triumph to, to, uh, to use in this debate. And, and this is something that we, are, that we are doing. If I would go case by case, what we have done over the 20 years, I think we would need a little bit more time but um, any anyone who is interested can also go to our to our website. Wonderful, thank you. And following up on that, uh, how exactly has the Abraham Accords uh, changed the relationships between Israel and the European Union? Yeah. So, so when I say that the Abraham Accords is a game changer, uh, I meant generally speaking. Uh, the truth of the matter is that Europe has been quite uh, slow and and resilient. Uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to join this process of normalization. I've been in, in, uh, in deep discussions with uh, EU officials to see how we can break this deadlock and how Europe can take a more active role, which will also be the uh, theme of our conference in March. Uh, the first perhaps uh, baby step was that there was money released from uh, uh, one of the EU commissioners uh, the, the Directorate for Enlargement and Neighborhood Policy, I think it was 10 million that was given to projects promoting the Abraham Accords. And uh, there is clearly an interest for Europe to, to come on board. There will, for example, there will be only next month, there will be the first official Abraham Accords uh, caucus or network launched in the European Parliament, um, headed by the President of the European Parliament. So um, Europe is slowly but surely uh, waking up to this. And, and I know that the policy from the European side is to see how Europe really, in a way, could uh, um, promote uh, corporations between you know, the signatories of the Abraham Accords and Israel. But, and this is important, they would, of course, like to include the Palestinians much more. And, and I think that's a, that's a reasonable and that's a good uh, uh, angle also for the Europeans to, to get involved. All right, thank you. Uh, Robert Slater asked, how has the war in Ukraine made things better or worse? Or has the war in Ukraine made things better or worse? Or no effect on the EU-Israel relation? Yeah, I, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, to some, to some extent, it's, it's very clear that uh, uh, in the current situation, Europe is looking for stable partners and allies, and there could be no better partner for, for Europe than, than Israel, also in a, in, a, in a broader geopolitical context. And, you know, we could talk about uh, 
energy security uh, at length. And this is, of course, uh, one of these effects of the war. You know, where will uh, Europe find um, its energy sources when, when we are no longer willing to, to trade with the Russians? Um, but also, on the other hand, there is, of course, I wouldn't say this is a dominant uh, uh, feeling in, in Brussels, but nevertheless, you hear it from time to time. You know, uh, wouldn't it be right of Israel to be more clearly on the side of um, this uh, European US uh, camp? And, and could, um, and I think the uh, enemies of Israel are, are often using this card to say that, you know, how, how can it be that, that, you know, Israel is not more clearly showing where their loyalties are. So that's what I meant when I said yes and no, it's a double-edged uh, sword. Um, and and um, maybe just one minute, one, one thing that I wanted to mention, because, mention before, and it's, it's um, part of this question, is also Israel's very problematic relations with Poland. And, and you know that Poland is, is one of the key uh, nations in the European uh, Union today, and, and sadly, these relations have been uh, really falling apart uh, over the last few years. And, and um, here, I think Israel could do more proactively to try to mend those relations, uh, because again, Poland is taking a huge responsibility in this war with, with Ukraine. And, and if I would have any advice to the new foreign minister, that would be to prioritize relations with, uh, with Poland. Thank you so much. James uh, Ramanovsky asks, if the PA depends on the EU for, for its financial lifeline, why doesn't the EU use this leverage to demand change in the PA school textbooks? Uh, and in the PA's continuous torrent of anti-Semitism, such as because the, the EU is just not uh, comprehending? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good question. It's also a very embarrassing question, you know, for, for any European, because it's, it's exactly through what he, um, what he um, insinuates. Uh, the way the responsible EU officials would, would look at it is, is the following. Uh, they say that they don't want to, um, um, I, I think it's some form of colonialism. It's like we don't really uh, treat them like we would treat our own people. And they said, well, you know, if we tell them this, you know, they will be upset with us and they'll run away and they'll, they don't like us anymore. They don't want to play with us anymore. And I hear this time and time again. Uh, it's not that when you speak one-on-one -on -one that they would disagree with you as to whether there are problems in Palestinian textbooks. It's more the approach to say, well, you know, how can we, how, how can we rectify this? We shouldn't be too tough. Uh, we shouldn't use uh, conditionality. Uh, but here I would disagree, and I would agree with, uh, with the gentleman who posed the question. Thank you so much. Uh, quite a few of our viewers would like to know which European nation you were referring to that was on the blacklist, if you're able to say. If not, that's okay. Well, let, let's. What, what I did say was that um, there was a... So on the blacklist are political parties, uh, so not nations. And um, uh, it's even more complex than that, and it means that some parties can be on the blacklist in the national capital, whereas they are okay in Brussels in a European Parliament uh, context. Um, but I, I better sort of keep it for the time being. I think in a private, private email exchange, I, I, I could uh, reveal more. But th this was just an illustration how, how, um, how Israel can shoot itself in the, in the foot. I have raised this personally with the Israeli foreign ministry. And, and I will continue to do so because I think there needs to be changes made. Absolutely, thank you. And before we go, can you tell our viewers where we can find some more of your work? So our website is uh, simply ec4, the number four, ec4i.org, or you can Google European Coalition for Israel. We, we record um, 
uh, monthly, what we call European reports, where we sit with a member of European Parliament in the studio and discuss issues related to uh, what we've been discussing today as well. Very wonderful. Thank you so much. We've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Mr. Sendell, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Of course. And for our viewers, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for an update with Ashley Perry. Thank you all for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.